acknowledging the country on which uh, we're meeting this evening. We're meeting on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation. I want to pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I want to acknowledge their continuing uh, connection and custodianship in respect of this land, which has gone on for many thousands of years. And I want to extend uh, a very warm welcome to any Indigenous colleagues or friends who join us here this evening. Shortly, um, we will be hearing from the uh, inaugural Michael Prom lecturer, the Honourable Rob French, uh, who of course is the former Chief Justice of Australia. Um, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. And uh, we also welcome uh, Mrs Valerie French, who joins uh, Robert French tonight. Can I also, of course, welcome the guest of honour, Michael Cromlin himself, uh, joined by his wife, Roz, and his children. Michael, I hope you have a wonderful evening. The lecture, the first in a, a series that's being launched tonight, uh, is to be held uh, every second year and hosted by the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies uh, the purpose of this lecture, of course, uh, is to honour the contribution of Michael, uh, not only to our law school, uh, but also to the public life and to public law in our country. Uh, this lecture will be followed tomorrow by uh, the conference hosted by the, Comparative, uh, the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies. Uh, and I'm sure many of you are planning to attend that conference uh, and um, I wish you all the best for it. Thank you again all for being here this evening. I'd now like to invite my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Jason Barubas, who is with um, Professor Adrian Stone, co-director of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies, uh, to introduce our distinguished speaker this evening. Um, Jason, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to Indigenous Australians present here this evening. I'm Professor Jace Bruhas, Director of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies here at Melbourne Law School. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural Michael Cromlin Lecture uh, this evening. This is the first in an ongoing biennial series of public lectures in honour of Professor Michael Cromlin AO. The series honours and celebrates Michael's tremendous contributions to Melbourne Law School over a period of 48 years of service and counting, a record of service that includes extraordinary contributions to leadership, including serving as the Dean of the Law School for 19 years, uh, during which time Michael's leadership transformed the Law School into one of the world's leading research and teaching institutions. Michael is originally from Brisbane and he completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Queensland, being awarded the University Medal before completing his master's and doctoral studies at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Having previously held lectureships at Queensland and University of British Columbia, he joined the University of Melbourne in 1975 as a senior lecturer in law. He has subsequently held the academic positions of reader in law, Zalman Cohen Professor of Law, Dean of the Law School, and is currently Professor Emeritus. His time at the Law School has been marked by an outstanding record of contribution, service and leadership, a willingness to consistently go beyond uh, the call of duty. Michael served as Dean of the Law School from 1989 to 2002, 2003 to 2007 and 2010 to 2011, a total of 19 years. And what is even more remarkable than his longevity as D is what he achieved, leading the law school through a period of major transformation, forging the institution into what it is today, 
one of the world's leading law schools, a globally renowned, outward-looking center of scholarly and pedagogical excellence. He is one of those rare people who has a capacity for strategic vision, twinned with an ability to execute and realize that vision. Highlights of Michael's significant achievements as Dean include the internationalization of the Melbourne LLB curriculum, establishment of the Melbourne Masters program, the establishment of the Melbourne uh, JD, and Michael oversaw creation of 10 new research centres. Under his leadership, the law school's number of academic staff more than doubled, the law school's operating budget expanded more than tenfold, and research funding also grew more than tenfold. During his period as dean, he established multiple links between Melbourne Law School and overseas law schools. And he oversaw the design, construction, and occupation of the law building uh, we're meeting in today. Uh, put simply, he put in place all of the fundamental building blocks that have made Melbourne Law School what it is today. And in doing so, he reshaped the landscape of legal education in this country and led thinking in the conceptualization and design of legal education internationally. The building we're standing in, whose design and construction Michael oversaw, stands as a totem of his vision for this institution. The building enveloped not in walls, but by windows, reflects a vision of an outward-looking institution. The windows reflect a desire to look outwards, engage, influence, and shape. And all of that is captured in a way that only an artist could capture, in the portrait of Michael uh, standing in the law school looking out through the windows with the outside world reflected back. His deanship is not only to be celebrated for what was achieved, but also for the way Michael led with integrity, determination, and egalitarian spirit, and with no ears and graces. He fostered a cohesive and thriving intellectual community in which staff felt supported by him individually and collectively. Now, in between all of that, uh, Michael also found time to teach 25 different courses at Melbourne and the leading institutions abroad in North America and Europe, many of these being novel courses conceptualized by him. He's held visiting professorships in North America and Europe, and he served on a range of professional and community organizations in Australia and internationally. And he's made a significant contribution to the work and international life of the, uh, sorry, of intellectual life of the Center for Comparative Constitutional Studies here at Melbourne Law School and the Center for Resources, Energy and Environmental Law of which he has served as director. Throughout his career, Michael has been also sought out to work on significant legal matters in Australia and North America across the areas of constitutional law, native title, and natural resources, and has also made many impactful contributions to public policy and legislative reform processes. Now, on top of all of those contributions and achievements, Michael is also one of Australia's foremost legal thinkers with a distinguished, distinguished global reputation. His scholarly work has framed legal thinking in Australia and abroad, and has often been characterized by a comparative approach. He's made significant contributions to thinking on constitutional law, and particularly federalism and executive power, to property law, and to natural resources law, the field of natural resources being one that Michael's work helped to forge as a distinct field of law. But Michael is one of those unusual scholars who has the expertise and capacity to think across established legal categories to reach solutions to multifaceted problems, this being most evident in his work on the public law dimensions of property law and natural resources. Now, as you can imagine, given that record, he's received numerous awards and honors throughout his career. And in 2009, he was appointed an officer in the General Division of the Order of Australia for service to the law and legal education 
particularly as a tertiary educator and through the development of mining and petroleum law in Australia. So we're delighted that Michael's record of extraordinary service and leadership in re is recognized and celebrated through the creation of the new Michael Cromlin series of lectures. Now we're honored that the inaugural Michael Cromlin lecture will be delivered by the Honorable Mr. Robert French, former Chief Justice of Australia, and one of the foremost judges and jurists in the common law world. Uh, Robert French AC served as Chief Justice of Australia from September 2008 until January 2017. During his tenure as Chief Justice, the High Court delivered significant judgments across a range of fields, including some of its most important judgments in the field of constitutional law, such as Williams and the Commonwealth No. 1 and Pape and Federal Commissioner of Taxation, Justice French delivering iconic lead judgments in each of these landmark decisions. Through his extrajudicial scholarly writing, he's made significant contributions and engaged in important debates across a range of fields, including statutory interpretation, constitutional law, and administrative law. Justice French is a graduate of the University of Western Australia in science and law. He served as a judge of the Federal Court of Australia from November 1986 until his appointment as Chief Justice of the High Court in September 2008. Since his retirement as Chief Justice, Justice French has been appointed as a non-permanent justice of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal, as an international judge of the Singapore International Commercial Court, and as a judge of the Court of Appeal of the Dubai International Financial Center. He was elected Chancellor of the University of Western Australia in December 2017, and he is also relevantly a professorial fellow of Melbourne Law School and has taught into the Melbourne Law Masters. The title of Justice French's address this evening is Executive Power and the Parliament Before and After Williams. And it's my great pleasure to invite Justice French to deliver the inaugural Michael Cromlin lecture. Thank you, Jason. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael and your family. Uh, this evening, uh, we celebrate an already celebrated legal scholar and university leader in Michael Cromlin. And it's as well that we do so, for the work of legal scholarship is indispensable to the development of our law, as is the work of academic leadership in the law. I think I met Michael Cromlin first when attending Melbourne University Law Summer School Lectures in 1978, in company with my good friend, the late Peter Johnston. There were four series of lectures over a fortnight. They were devoted to constitutional law, mining law, company law, and competition law. Now, Michael spoke on either constitutional law or mining law, but sadly, with the passing 46 years, I cannot now remember which it was. Whatever it was, he was extremely well qualified to speak on both, and it was impressive. Apart from honouring Michael this evening in speaking about executive law, uh, executive power, I want also to acknowledge the role of the Legal Academy in the development of our understanding of executive power, albeit sometimes from a perspective of criticism of its judicial exposition. That understanding, incomplete as it is, is important, uh, not least in the face of the current referendum about the establishment of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Parliament and the executive government of the Commonwealth, in which people ask such questions as what is the executive government of the Commonwealth? What does it do? And could the voice affect the exercise of its powers? Uh, those questions also raise the general issue about whether we can develop an understanding of executive power which is capable of communication be beyond the halls of the academy and courts. That is not a trivial undertaking. In an article entitled The Executive, in Greg Craven of, uh, I am beside myself in outrage and <laughs> fame, uh, in the uh, convention debates published in 1986, Michael characterised the distribution of executive powers in chapter two of the, of the Constitution as, quote, suggestive of their expression. In Pape and the Federal Commissioner of Taxation in 2009, I referred to that observation and his quotation of a passage from Professor Harrison Moore's Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia, in which Harrison Moore said, 
For more than one reason, statutes defining the constitutions of the colonies have been almost silent on the subject of powers as of the organization of the executive. As Michael went on to observe, and I quoted, the sources of executive power and statute and the prerogative were recognized in the conventions, but it is not clear how they were reflected in the constitution. His observations on the prerogative had been quoted in Reed Patterson, H. Parte Taylor, and again by Justices Gummo and Bell in Williams number one. Now in preparation for this evening, I came across another paper written by Michael, published in 1986, entitled The Commonwealth Executive, A Deliberate Enigma. This was obtained by interlibrary loan from Melbourne Law School Library, which was determined to charge me $30 for the privilege of access to this heritage document, and was unimpressed by the fact that I was writing a lecture in honour of its author. <laughs> However, all is well that ends well. Melbourne Law School is giving me a credit. <laughs> I might add that this was not the only paper authored by Michael that I retrieved from the Melbourne Law School Library. He also wrote on federal provincial cooperation on national resources, a comparative discussion of problems and solutions in the same series entitled Papers on Federalism, which touched upon the important topic of intergovernmental agreements, a topic still requiring exploration in relation to the executive power of the Commonwealth and its legislative implementation by use of the incidental power under Section 5139. Now, that was another $30, but, but another credit is on the way. Michael's 1986 paper dealt with the drafting history of Section 61 and made important observations about the executive power. And it's against that background I want to make some remarks about how the power is constrained by statute and where it requires statutory support. There are two lines of cases relevant to those two general areas of inquiry. On the first, which I think involves questions of statutory construction, I'll refer to Ruddick and Vidalis in the full federal court, CPCF and the Minister uh, in the High Court and the recent decision of the High Court in Davis and the Minister for Immigration, which was delivered in April of this year. The second line of cases I'll refer to in relation to the second issue uh, are PAIC, Williams number one and Williams number two. Both of them, both lines, go to the relationship of the executive and the parliament in the context of responsible government. Both are works in progress. Pape and Williams also raised questions about the place of Australian federalism in defining and limiting the scope of Commonwealth executive power. They raised questions of accountability in the lawful expenditure of public money and in relation to modes of Commonwealth executive expenditure other than by statutory authority or constitutional executive power. There is a question about the extent to which the executive power of the Commonwealth to enter into intergovernmental agreements may extend its effective content. Of course, the use of Section 96 of the Constitution, the conditional grants power to give effect to such agreements has recently been described, although not litigated, in the Hornsby Shire Council and the Commonwealth. In the drafting of the Australian Constitution, the content of the words, the executive power of the Commonwealth, which found their way into Section 61, was not the subject of extensive exposition. The Constitutional Committee, established in 1891 by the National Australasian Convention to adopt, uh, to draft a federal constitution, had among its list for, of issues for decision, apparently drafted by Griffith, an executive with, quote, powers correlative to those of the legislature. The committee ultimately produced a document which proposed an executive government but said nothing about its powers. In the course of debate in 1891, Samuel Griffith said, it is proposed that the Commonwealth's executive authority shall be coextensive with its legislative power. That follows as a matter of course. And that was the thinking which seems to have underpinned a common assumption called into question by the court in the course of argument in Williams number one. Consistently with that understanding, uh, clause eight of, uh, of the draft in 1891, which had not appeared in the original draft, Ingus Clark or Kingston, provided that the executive power and authority of the Commonwealth shall extend to all matters with respect to which the legislative powers of the parliament may be exercised, excepting only matters being within the legislative powers of a state with respect to which the parliament of the state for the time being exercises such powers. That clause, however, was amended on Sir Samuel's motion uh, to read, the executive power and authority of the Commonwealth shall extend to the execution of the provisions of this Constitution 
and the laws of the Commonwealth. And Sir Samuel said of the amendment, that amendment covers all that is meant by the clause, clause eight, and is quite free from ambiguity. Well, it didn't and it wasn't. As Michael uh, remarked in his 1986 paper on executive power, Sir Samuel displayed, quote, an optimism that history has shown to be misplaced. And as was to appear from Williams number one, the scope of the power in the original clause was not transmitted to the amended clause and thus to the ultimate product, section 61. And that difference was to be significant to the relationship between the executive and the parliament reflected in the relationship between executive power and the lawmaking power of the parliament. In spare reference to the content of the executive power, Edmund Barton described it as primarily divided into two classes, those exercised by the prerogative and those which are ordinary executive acts where it is prescribed that the executive shall act in council. He described the second as the offsprings of statute. And Quick and Garan put it thus, Executive acts were either one, exercised by prerogative, or two, statutory, if only it was so simple. Michael Cromwell's 1986 paper on the enigma of executive power began with a reference to that drafting history. He looked at the scope of the power. The scope of the prerogative power itself was difficult to disentangle from the question of how it was acquired by the Governor General, who was, uh, under the terms of the Constitution, the repository of the power. The framers of the Constitution could have adopted the colonial practice of using prerogative instruments, such as letters patent, rather than the provisions of the Constitution. Uh, and that question was connected to the question about the appointment of the Governor General by the Queen, which under Section 2 of the Constitution uh, was accompanied with such powers and functions of the Queen as Her Majesty may be pleased to assign to him. But after debate on that provision, agreement was reached that it was the object to ensure that the Constitution conferred upon ministers of the Crown all the prerogatives of the Crown appropriate to uh, the Commonwealth. When, uh, uh, and Michael's uh, then characterised Griffith's position as being that the conferral of appropriate prerogative powers upon the Governor General would be a natural consequence of the establishment of the Commonwealth rather than as a result of any one provision of Chapter 2 of the Constitution, an important observation. But when I reached uh, page 35 of Michael's paper, I found a theatre ticket to a performance of Giselle by the Australian Ballet at the Arts Centre on, in Melbourne on Tuesday, 17 March 2015. It was a student ticket. It was apparent from the presence of that ticket and numerous pencil markings that Michael's work had reached more than one young mind over a period of at least 29 years. <laughs> the student uh, ticket appeared in the section immediately preceding the conclusion which was expressed in the following terms by reference back to the drafting history. Quote, the outcome of these deliberations was a very meagre set of provisions relating to the executive branch of government. Unlike chapter one of the constitution, chapter two was intended to mask rather than prescribe the workings of the, the executive. The reasons are understandable, if not entirely convincing. The executive branch of government was shrouded in mystery partly attributable to the uncertain scope and status of the prerogative. The task of committing its essential features to writing was daunting indeed. Moreover, the price of undertaking that task would be a loss of flexibility in the future development of the executive. Politicians who were the beneficiaries of half a century of colonial constitutional development placed a high value upon such flexibility. And Michael observed that perhaps the clearest message to emerge from the convention debates was that no great store could be placed upon the language of the several provisions of chapter two. Other sources were intended to make a much greater contribution to the executive branch of government. He identified convention and statute. However, no real attention had been paid to the role of parliament in shaping and supervising the executive branch. Such a role, he said, must surely have been assumed, quote, no proposal regarding the executive denied a role to parliament. Whatever else may have been implicit in the responsible government, which ultimately found favour with delegates, legislative supremacy over the executive must have been included. And it was the relationship between the executive and the parliament that was to be the focus of much subsequent judicial exegesis of the executive power. I might add that uncertainty about the scope of executive power, of course, is not limited to Australia. 
Paul Craig and Adam Tompkins, writing in a collection of essays published in 2006, referred to what they call the inadequacy of formal definitions of executive power and described it as an underlying shared phenomenon, citing the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand and Germany for gaps and silences in relation to the executive. There's a wonderful quotation from an Indian judge, Justice Mukherjee, writing in 1967 about the Indian constitution, uh, who said, executive power can never be constitutionally defined and all constitutional efforts to define it must necessarily fail. Executive power is an undefinable, multi-dimensional constitutional concept, varying from time to time, from situation to situation, and with the changing concepts of states in political philosophy and po political science. Now, Michael's reference to flexibility in the future development of the executive directs attention to the nature of the developmental process. The words can be said to offer constructional choices only in the broadest sense. It may be better to see them as setting a framework for a common law process of case-by-case -case development of the law. And of course, we have many examples of that kind of open textured phrasing, not only in constitutions, but also in statutes. Examples are found in such statutory forms as misleading or deceptive conduct or manner of new manufacture in the Patents Act. The judicial development of the content of executive power is not so much a process of choosing available meanings as the building of layers of meaning to deal with a variety of circumstances. That is why I call it a work still in progress. Constitutional questions about executive power may present themselves in novel circumstances in which, uh, which uh, its scope has not previously been considered directly. There was something of that in the case which came before the full court of the federal court in Ruddock and Vidalis in 2001. It would take its place in the line of cases concerned with the effect of statutes upon non-statutory executive power, by which I mean executive power derived from the provisions of the constitution itself and not conferred by statute. The facts are reasonably well known. The Norwegian vessel Tampa, in answer to a request from the Australian government, rescued 433 people from a wooden fishing boat sing in the, in the Indian Ocean, about 140 miles north of Christmas Island, the territory of Australia. The Tampa headed towards Christmas Island. The Australian government directed the Tampa not to enter Australian territorial waters. It did so. SAS officers boarded the ship with a view of facilitating its departure from Australian waters and also providing medical and humanitarian assistance, the evidence supported an inference that many of the rescuees, as they were called, would, if entitled, wish to apply for protection visas and would wish to leave the ship and enter Australia. Applications were filed in the federal court by a Melbourne solicitor, Eric Vidalis, seeking habeas corpus in relation to the alleged unlawful detention of the rescuees. The Victorian Council of Civil Liberties also filed an application seeking mandatory and associated orders. The primary judge, Justice North, held that the rescuees were being detained and made orders for their release to the Australian mainland. He gave that judgment on the 11th of September, 2001. The appeal before the full federal court commenced on the 13th of September and judgment was delivered on the 18th of September. In issue was the scope of the executive power of the Commonwealth deriving from section 61 of the constitution and whether that extended to taking action to prevent the landing of the rescuees in Australia and whether in any event, if such a power had existed, it was displaced by the statutory regime created by the Migration Act. The appeal was allowed by a majority comprising Justice Beaumont and myself, Chief Justice Black dissented. Uh, as I wrote the majority judgment, I will refer only descriptively to my conclusions relating to section 61 and its relationship to the statutory regime. In doing so, it's not my intention to elaborate upon or defend them. The judgment is still lovingly excoriated by all right-thinking people. <laughs> well, the late Professor George Wiesenden uh, once gave a uh, seminar in, uh, at this university, I think, in which I was present, uh, comprehensively uh, denouncing the decision. Uh, I was a contemporary visit to UWA Law School, and I said to him afterwards, look, I'm like that knight in Monty Python's quest for the Holy Grail, just flesh wounds, George. The decision was an event, albeit much debated, in the history of the development of executive power jurisprudence in Australia. 
It had to grapple with some fundamental questions about executive power, and at least part of what was said about executive power and the prerogative found a resonance in the second line of cases to which I'll be referring with this page and following. Section 61 was characterised in what I'll call a majority judgment as the primary source of executive power extending to the execution and maintenance of the common constitution and the laws of the Commonwealth, but limited by those terms. It did not authorise the Commonwealth to act inconsistently with the distribution of powers and the limits on power for which the Constitution provided, nor did it authorise the Commonwealth to act otherwise than according to the laws of the Commonwealth. Reference was made to the prerogatives and the modern relationship of the power to the prerogatives of the Crown, particularly the discussion by Chief Justice Mason in Barton and the Commonwealth, in which His Honour said of the power, it enables the Crown to undertake all executive action which is appropriate to the position of the Commonwealth under the Constitution and to the spheres of the responsibility vested in it by the Constitution. It includes the prerogative powers of the Crown, that is, the powers afforded to the Crown by the common law. The judgment observed that the use of the term prerogative to describe such a power might properly acknowledge its historical antecedents, but not adequately illuminate its origins and reference was made to what Justice Gummer had written some 13 years before in a case called Reed Ditford, in which he said, in Australia, one looks not to the content of the prerogative in Britain, but rather to section 61 of the Constitution, by which the executive power of the Commonwealth was vested in the Crown. The spheres of responsibility vested in the Crown by the Constitution had been described in Davis and the Commonwealth, which I'll call the bicentennial celebration case, uh, which one constitutional academic had told me really just dealt with the power of the Commonwealth to throw a party, uh, as derived from the distribution of legislative powers affected by the Constitution itself and from the character and status of the Commonwealth as a national polity. In that case, Justice Brennan had agreed generally with the observation of Justice Jacobs in the AAP case that the phrase maintenance of the Constitution imports the idea of Australia as a nation. And Justice Brennan saw the phrase as assigning to the federal government functions relating not only to the institutions of the government, but more generally to the protection and advancement of the, straight, of the Australian nation. The relationship of executive power to statute law was of significance in Ruddock, given the legislative regime controlling the detention and removal of unlawful non-citizens, as they were called in the Migration Act. There was discussion of the subjection of the executive powers of the Commonwealth to parliamentary control and reference to legal history about the bases upon which statutory law might abrogate or regulate the prerogative. As a general proposition, in the majority judgment, it was necessary to construe the relevant statute to determine whether by express words or necessary implication it had any and if so what operation upon the executive power. Further, the executive power could not be treated simply as a species of the royal prerogative understood as, quote, the residue of discretionary or arbitrary authority, which at any given time is legally left in the, ha in the hands of the Crown. And a view of the executive power was then expressed, which I will quote, while the executive power may derive some of its content by reference to the royal prerogative, it is a power conferred as part of a negotiated federal compact expressed in a written constitution, distributing powers between three arms of government reflected in chapters one, two, and three of the constitution, and as to legislative powers between the polities that comprise the federation. The power is subject not only to the limitations as to subject matter that flow directly from the constitution, but also to the laws of the uh, Commonwealth made under it. Now, it's unnecessary to expand further on the judgment beyond saying that the executive power was held to extend to the prevention of unlawful entry into Australia and that the Migration Act did not observe, uh, did not uh, uh, displace it. Chief Justice Black, in what is universally called a powerful dissent, took a different view of the content of the executive power and his words often quoted, uh, observed, if it be accepted that the asserted executive power to exclude aliens in time of peace is at best doubtful at common law, the question arises whether section 61 of the Constitution provides some larger source of such a power. It would be a very strange circumstance if the at best doubtful and historically long unused power to exclude or expel should emerge in a strong modern form from section 61 of the Constitution 
by virtue of general conceptions of the national interest. This is all the more so as when, according to English constitutional theory, new prerogative powers cannot be created. Uh, the Chief Justice also explored the relationship between status and the prerogative and um, statute and the prerogative and cited authority for the proposition that where the prerogative is relied on as an alternative source of power to action under a statute, it will be held to be displaced when the, same, when the statute covers the subject matter. Uh, there was an application for special leave to the High Court, but the interim removal of the rescuees to New Zealand and Nauru under an agreement between the government and the uh, applicants rendered the appeal moot and special leave was refused. Uh, there was an interesting sequel incidentally to the uh, appeal when the question of costs came up. Uh, and uh, in that matter, Chief Justice Black and I joined forces to hold that no order for costs should be made having regard to the public interest dimensions of the case. Now, the Com Commonwealth made an interesting submission. The Commonwealth submitted that, quote, that the litigation was, quote, an interference with the exercise of executive power analogous to a non-justiciable active state. And Chief Justice Black and I observed that it is not an interference with the exercise of executive power to determine whether it exists in relation to the subject matter in which it is applied and whether what is done within its scope even in the United Kingdom, unencumbered by a written constitution, the threshold question whether an act is done under prerogative power is justiciable. Uh, following the decision in Rudd, the Parliament uh, enacted the Border Protection Validation and Enforcement Powers Act 2001, this is what I call a just-in-case validation enactment, which said all action to which this part applies is taken for all purposes to have been lawful when it occurred. Uh, there's a forward-reaching uh, resonance when you see the legislative response to uh, Williams number two, which in effect retrospectively sought to validate expenditures which were referable to some head of, of constitutional, statutory, uh, uh, constitutional power. That Act also introduced a new provision, Section 7A, into the Migration Act which said the existence of statutory powers under the Act does not prevent the exercise of any executive power of the Commonwealth to protect Australian borders, including where necessary, by ejecting persons who have crossed these borders. Now, again, going forward to a case called CPCF, which I'll refer to at the moment, you'll find in the Maritime Powers Act, there is a section five which in more concise terms says more or less the same thing, but the provisions of this Act did not affect the executive power of the Commonwealth. And that, uh, so the question of the content of executive power to uh, uh, interdict entry into Australia and the effect upon it, statute law, came out a good deal later, 2015, in CPCF of the Minister for Immigration. And there, the court was concerned with the powers of the Commonwealth officers to interdict and detain at sea potential unlawful entrance to Australia, including the plaintiff, who was a Sri Lankan national of Tamil ethnicity, claiming to be a refugee. The court held by majority that a provision of the Maritime Powers Act 2013 authorised a maritime officer to detain the plaintiff for the purpose of taking him or causing him to be taken to a place outside Australia, in that case, India. The majority, which I was part, found it unnecessary, unnecessary to answer the question posed by the Commonwealth's fallback position, which was that non-statutory executive power would uh, uh, authorise the interdiction, the tamper question. In that connection, Section 5 of the MPA, which I've mentioned, uh, provided that, quote, this act does not limit the executive power of the Commonwealth. So it was much more concise than seven, Section 7A. Uh, the Commonwealth submitted that Section 5 negative any implication that the act excluded Commonwealth executive power in relation to the matters in which it applied. Um, I observed uh, in my judgment that whatever the proper construction of Section 5, it could not be taken as preserving unconstrained an executive power, the exercise of which was constrained by the MPA. Uh, Justices Hayne and Bell held that the MPA did not authorise the detention and removal of the plaintiff to India at the time the destination was chosen. And as to the existence of a non-statutory power to do the same thing, they observed it is greatly to be doubted that the Maritime Powers Act and Section 5 in particular should be read as permitting so strange a result. Justices Hayne and Bell did not engage 
uh, in their judgment, with the Tampa finding on executive power. However, I must say, in fairness to Justice Hayne, that in a subsequent extracurial paper given at this university, he said, uh, I think reasonably unequivocally, I'm saying this in his presence, and he'll no doubt correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, Tampa should not be followed. Uh, Justice Crennan held that Section 72.4 of the Maritime uh, uh, Powers Act authorised a maritime officer to take the steps of detention for the purpose of taking the plaintiff to India. Justice Kiefel arrived in the same position as Justices Hayne and Bell, but she moved on to, to consider the non-statutory power of the executive government. And she, held, uh, she had held that the detention of the plaintiff was not authorised by the statute. Uh, and she uh, said, even if one assumes for present purposes that a Commonwealth executive power of the kind contended for existed at Federation, statutes have for a long time provided for powers of expulsion and detention. As a matter of principle, any Commonwealth executive power may in those circumstances be considered lost or displaced. And she referred to what she characterised as the constitutional principle that any prerogative power is to be regarded as displaced or abrogated where the Parliament has legislated on the same topic. Justice Gagler, also part of the majority, undertook an extensive consideration of the statutory power and in the event held that the plaintiff was lawfully detained under that power. He did not consider the fallback argument from the Commonwealth about non-statutory executive power, observing that if the proper conclusion is that the plaintiff was lawfully detained under section 72.4 of the Act, that conclusion is a complete answer to the plaintiff's claim and the other substantive questions, in particular, the constitutional question need not be answered. Justice Keane, who also formed part of the majority, held that the detention was authorised by statute, but went on to consider the fallback position and came to the view that it was well settled at the power of the executive government under the common law to deny entry into Australia of a non-citizen, including by compulsion, was an incident of Australia's sovereign power as a nation. Uh, he cited uh, Attorney General Canada and Kane, Rock Tomlies and Bredham, and Rudder and Vidalis, and went on to hold that the power had not been abrogated by the relevant legislation. So the question that's perhaps left open by that is the test for statutory abrogation of executive power. Is any legislation on the subject area sufficient for that purpose? Is some kind of covering the field test appropriate? In my view, it's always a matter of statutory construction. Provisions such as Section 7A of the Migration Act and Section 5 of the Maritime Powers Act cannot be disregarded. It is for Parliament to determine the extent to which it will supplant non-statutory executive power with confined and constrained statutory power or expunge it altogether. A recent development of the work in progress concerning the relationship between Parliament and the executive reflected in the effects of statute law on executive power was seen in the judgment of the High Court in Davis and the Minister for Immigration, uh, which was delivered in April of this year. And the constitutional power in question was the, that of a minister to give non-statutory instructions to officers of a relevant department under Section 64 of the Constitution. So there's this provision of the Migration Act, Section 351, says uh, if the Administrative Appeals Tribunal has given an applicant for a visa, uh, an unfavourable result, the Minister may consider whether or not to um, make a more favourable decision, uh, that is to say, to grant a visa. Uh, but the Minister has to do that personally, and the Ministry is not required even to consider whether, um, whether uh, uh, the um, application should be, whether he should uh, entertain the application. So there are two steps. First of all, um, the procedural step, as the High Court called it, I have to consider whether I'm going to consider, and then the substantive step, I'm going to consider. Uh, and so the Minister issued these instructions to his um, officers uh, not to refer a request to exercise the power in any case in which the departmental officers considered not to have unique or exceptional circumstances. And it was not in dispute that neither the ministerial instructions nor departmental decisions based upon them constituted the exercise of a statutory power. So he wasn't exercising a statutory power when he gave them those instructions. Each was the purported exercise of an executive function of the Commonwealth conferred by Section 61 
being a purported exercise of an executive function incidental to the administration of the Act. Uh, so in the event, the decision was, the statute says the minister has got to do it personally. It's, the function is exclusive to the minister, and that exclusivity uh, trumps uh, the uh, executive power to give instructions and the executive power of uh, the departmental officers to act on those instructions in such a way as to effectively decide whether the minister should consider. Um, uh, there's a bit of uh, uh, almost a mi mixture of Sir Humphrey and Kafka in all of this uh, with uh, the, two, the two steps. Uh, so section 351 in effect required that the power both in procedural and substantive limits be exercised personally by the minister. And the critical distinction was drawn between the situation in which officials assist the minister to exercise the power uh, and officials permissibly acting under an authorisation in order to exercise the minister's power under the, uh, under the statute. In an early uh, academic commentary in Auspub Law published in June, Professor Maria O'Sullivan observed that in relation to the lawfulness of those administrative guidelines or ministerial guidelines, much of the discussion in the hearing of the case was about whether the guidelines merely allowed the departmental officers to provide assistance and advice to the minister. Those guidelines provided that cases assessed by the department as not having unique or exceptional circumstances were to be finalised without referral. The decision, as she said, clarifies the lawful boundaries of executive guidelines. It also demonstrates that the line between a statutory and non-statutory exercise of power is not clearly defined. The power to give an instruction uh, was derived from section 351 of the Migration Act and, there's, uh, and sections 61 and 64 of the Constitution, but not from some non-statutory uh, source. Now, they're, they're the cases to which I wanted to refer in connection with the interaction between statute law and executive power. The obverse question, or the different question, which was addressed in Pape, Williams number one and Williams number two, is to what extent does the executive power of the Commonwealth require statutory authority for its exercise? A Pape, as we know, concerned the validity of the tax bonus uh, Act for work, I'm sorry, the Tax Bonus for Working Australians Act of 2009, which made provisions for payments to Australian resident taxpayers. None of that people, taxpayers were going to get checks ranging from $250 to $950 and go out and buy a screen town television or something and thus keep us all afloat above the uh, troubled waters of the global financial uh, crisis. Brian Pape, a lecturer in law at the University of New England, would have been entitled to $250 under Section 7 of the Act. But uh, as I've characterised him, he was the man who tried to bite the hand that tried to feed him. He didn't want it, and he sued the Commissioner of Taxation, asserting that the legislation was beyond power. Justices Gummo, Crenn and Bell and I held that the determination by the Executive Government of a need for an immediate fiscal stimulus to the national uh, economy enlivened legislative power under section 5139, that's the incidental power, to enact the Tax Bonus Act as a law uh, incidental to that exercise. Justices Hayden, Hayden and Kiefel dissented in relation to that proposition, however they held the Tax Bonus Act to be a valid enactment under section 512 of the Constitution. So Mr Pape lost the case. Yet, by the way, he represented himself in the High Court and made a very credible presentation of very engaging advocate. However, an important principle which emerged from the case was a win for his view of the executive power of the Commonwealth in relation to public expenditure. And that was the proposition that sections 81 and 83 of the Constitution do not confer a substantive spending power. Appropriation is a necessary condition of the expenditure. The power to spend appropriated monies is to be found elsewhere in the Constitution or statutes made under it. Uh, Justices Gummo, Crennan and Bell accepted the formulation of executive power by Justice Brennan in the Davis case, where he said, it does not follow that the executive government of the Commonwealth is the arbiter of its own power, or that the executive power of the Commonwealth extends to whatever activity or enterprise the executive government determines to be in the national interest. But section 61 does confer on the executive government 
how to engage in enterprises and activities peculiarly adapted to the government of the nation and which cannot otherwise be carried on for the benefit of the nation. The executive government was said to be the arm of government capable of and empowered to respond to a crisis, be it war, natural disaster, or a financial crisis on the scale here. It had its roots in the executive power exercised in the United Kingdom up to the time of the adoption of the Constitution, but today in Australia is a power to act on behalf of the federal polity. Federalism was an important qualifier, reflected in the statement of Chief Justices Mason, Dean and Gordon in Davis and cited by Justices Gummo, Crennan and Bell in Pape, where, they, where it was said the existence of Commonwealth executive power in areas beyond the express grants of legislative power will ordinarily be clearest, where the Commonwealth executive or legislative action involves no real competition with state executives or legislative competence. In PAPE, it was not seriously disputed by the intervening states that only the Commonwealth had the resources available to respond promptly to the financial crisis on the scale exemplified by the Tax Bonus Act. Their interventions, that's of the states, were motivated by concerns about a wide reading of the scope of Section 61. Justices Hayne and Kiefel, in rejecting the application of the executive power, observed that the executive's power to spend money is not confined to expenditures made in accordance with the law made by the Commonwealth under a new, made by the Parliament under an enumerated head of legislative power. But the executive power generally, the executive power to spend is not unlimited. Its limits are determined in the same manner as are the limits on the executive power generally. Pape advanced the general proposition uh, about the content of executive power that did not confine it by reference to the prerogatives, one, the prerogatives, and two, the statutes, as Quick and Garand had said. The power to expend public money was to be derived by satisfaction of the necessary requirements of parliamentary appropriation and the existence of a substantive power to be found either in statute or in non-statutory executive power under the Constitution. Uh, later on in ICM Agriculture, Proprietary Visit in the Commonwealth, Justices Gummo, Credit and I said with reference to PAPE, it is now settled that the provisions in Section 81 of the Constitution for establishment of the Consolidated Revenue Fund and in Section 83 for parliamentary appropriations do not confer a substantive spending power and that the power to expend appropriated monies must be found elsewhere in the Constitution or the laws of the Commonwealth. Well, Pape set the scene for Williams No. 1, which concerned the validity of an agreement between the Commonwealth and the Scripture Union in Queensland. And under that agreement, the Scripture Union was to provide chaplaincy services and to ensure they were delivered as identified in its application for funding. The plaintiff, who was a parent of children attending a Queensland school, challenged the validity of the agreement and the lawfulness of payments uh, by the Commonwealth pursuant to it. One of those grounds was that the agreement and the payments were beyond the executive power of the Commonwealth under Section 61. Six of the seven justices held that the agreement was beyond the executive power and that the making of payments by the Commonwealth in the Scripture Union under the agreement was not supported by Section 61. In their joint judgment, Justices Gummo and Bell observed that the court had eschewed any attempt to define exhaustively the content of executive power identified but not explicated in Section 61. Michael Cromlin was uh, headlined again when they observed, to some degree, this state of affairs in the analysis of Section 61 may reflect the considerations expressed by Professor Com Cromlin in a passage in his study of the drafting of the sparse provisions, Chapter 2 of the Constitution, which was quoted in Reed Patterson, ex parte Taylor. Uh, the passage which I refer to is that uh, taken from uh, his essay on the executive in Greg Craven's convention debates. And uh, they characterised, that is, Justices uh, Gummo and Bell, characterised the immediate issues in the litigation as requiring consideration of the relationship between the federal executive and the uh, federal parliament. They drew a distinction between the capacity of the parliament to qualify or abrogate at least some aspects of the executive power and the scope of the executive power in respect of matters which could be the subject of legislation. And that distinction is reflected in the two lines of cases to which I've referred earlier in this uh, lecture. 
The general submission of the Commonwealth that executive power extended to entry into contracts and the spending of money without any legislative authority beyond appropriation was answered in the negative. Section 64 was never held. Expenditure upon the chaplaincy program did not fall within the ordinary and well-recognised functions of the government of the Commonwealth. It was not in dispute that these functions would include the Commonwealth entering into agreements with the states, particularly with reference to the referral by state parliaments of matters pursuant to section 5137 and the engagement of section 96 of the constitution. Federal considerations were also addressed in the joint judgment and the circumstances giving rise to enlivening the executive power and PAPE were distinguished from the circumstances which led to the Williams litigation. The position that uh, had emerged from PAPE uh, that federal considerations limited the scope of executive power was supported by and entirely consistent with prior considerations. My own view was that assuming it to be the case that the agreement and expenditure could be referred to one or other of the heads of power relied upon by the Commonwealth, they were fields in which the Commonwealth and the states had concurrent legislative competencies subject to section 109 of the Constitution, giving paramountcy to Commonwealth law. The character of the Commonwealth Government as a national government did not entitle it as a general proposition to enter into any such field of activity by executive action alone. Such an extension of executive powers would, in a practical sense, as Alfred Deakin had predicted, correspondingly reduce those of the states and compromise what Inglis Clark had described as the essential and distinctive feature of a truly federal government. Well, in response to Williams number one, the Commonwealth enacted the Financial Framework Legislation Amendment Act number three, 2012, which amended the Financial Management and Accountability Act and regulations made under it to confer power on the Commonwealth to make, vary or administer arrangements under which public money was or might become payable by the Commonwealth and grants of financial assistance, which are part of the Act the Commonwealth did not have power to make. And section 32B1 of the amended Act uh, gave effect to that uh, uh, purpose and uh, effectively sought to validate ongoing programs and payments already made. Mr Williams had another go and on his challenge the court held that the legislative power of the parliament to grant authority to make a commitment to public money was founded uh, in every head of legislative power which supported the making of the payments with which section 32b dealt. It should be read as providing the Commonwealth with power to make arrangements or grants but only where it was within the power of the Commonwealth to authorise the making of those arrangements or grants. So the validity of the section depended upon it being supported by a head of legislative power. The court said and um, held that the impugned provisions were not for the provisions of benefits to students within section 5123A of the Constitution, which was relied upon by the Commonwealth, and were not supported by any other head of legislative power. The court was invited to revisit Williams number two, number one, but declined to do so. And in the joint judgment of five members of the court, Justices Hayne, Keefall, Bell, Keane and Beat, the effects of Pape and Williams were restated thus. In PAPE, all members of the court concluded that sections 81 and 83 of the Constitution do not confer a substantive spending power. All members of the court agreed that the power to spend appropriated monies must be found elsewhere in the Constitution or in statutes made under it. The majority of the court held that the determination of the executive government that there was a need for an immediate fiscal stimulus to the national economy in light of legislative power under section 5139 to enact the impugned law as a law incidental to the exercise of that power. In dealing with uh, arguments uh, advanced by the Commonwealth by reference to British constitutional history and the executive uh, power of common law, the joint judgment observed that consideration of executive power of the Commonwealth will be assisted by reference to British constitutional history, but the determination of the ambit of the executive power of the Commonwealth cannot begin from a premise that the ambit of that executive power must be the same as the ambit of uh, British executive uh, power. So Pape and the Williams cases tell us that the executive government of the Commonwealth cannot spend public money on anything without an appropriation and legal authority deriving from statute or from 
non-statutory executive power to be found in the Constitution itself. There are, however, few litigants who would want to go to court to test the validity of a payment. There are many more prepared to test the correctness of an exaction. The general question arises today, how is the executive held to account? The judicial process is an ad hoc mechanism of accountability. In a submission to the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit inquiring into Commonwealth Grants Administration in October last year, Professor Ann Turmey observed that those who actively approve the grants are rarely aware of the limits uh, on their powers that are derived from the limited legislative support for the spending program. As a result, in her opinion, much of the expenditure under the grant scheme is unlawful or at least of doubtful legal validity. She put it thus, in typically blunt language, this needs to stop. Government should not be unlawfully spending public money. The principle of the rule of law means that the law, including the Constitution, binds the government in relation to the expenditure of public money. But from my quick reading of the committee's report, that concern does not appear to have led to any substantive response. The question arises, who is accountable for public expenditure, quite apart from the ethical integrity of grants programs of which we have heard much in recent times, and to whom are they accountable? Uh, this may be illustrated uh, by the field of higher education, for which the Commonwealth has no express constitutional responsibility. While federal funding for Commonwealth-appointed places and scholarships in reliance upon Section 5123A uh, may have benefits to actual persons, as I think Justice Crennan mentioned in Williams Number 2, the same may not be true of research funding or capital funds. And in that respect, I refer to an interesting discussion by Shipper Accordia, Andrew Lynch and George Williams on Commonwealth executive power and spending after Williams number two in the Melbourne University Law Review. Does the Auditor General ask questions about the lawfulness of Commonwealth action in this area? There's no doubt that in theory, at least, the Williams cases have marked out legal boundaries for executive spending power, albeit they're not bright line boundaries when it comes to non-statutory executive power. Uh, Glenn Ryle in a parliamentary paper in 2014 said that Williams can be viewed as a turning point for parliamentary accountability and federalism in Australia. He added that while the legislative response might raise doubts about whether in a practical sense it could be considered a turning point, uh, those doubts are ameliorated by the general consensus that if not all of the legislative response, at least certain spending schemes authorised under it remain invalid. Um, I'm not sure whether that isn't an over-optimistic assessment of the outcome. The legislation which responded to Williams number one was an attempt at a global fix, providing a legislated substitute for what we call the common assumption in Williams number one. And like the just in case legislation that followed Ruddock and Vidalis, it validated all that could be validated. Whether it did so validly may be debated. The executive power of the Commonwealth is, of course, extended to funding programs well beyond those which might find support in heads of Commonwealth legislative power. Where such programs can be affected by grants to the states, the general powers, the generous powers, I should say, available under Section 96 of the Constitution are available, with conditions to which the states must agree if they are to receive the money, but which they often find to be offers too good to refuse, and with few constitutional constraints. Now, one example of the constraint perhaps being a grant scheme condition which requires states to acquire property on other than just terms. Intergovernmental agreements between the Commonwealth and the states may be seen as the exercise of the executive power of both. They may be effected by Section 96 grants. They may be effected by referral of powers from the states to the Commonwealth under Section 5137 of the Constitution, usually in the form of an agreed legislative text subject to amendment only with the agreement of the referring states. Then it may be that an intergovernmental agreement as an exercise of non-statutory executive power will enliven the incidental power under section 5139 of the Constitution. And it was a combination of non-statutory executive power and the incidental power which supported the Tax Bonus Act in paper. How far can intergovernmental agreements go in giving content to non-statutory executive power? Is the incidental power in that context analogous to the external affairs power which enables legislation on a range of topics covered by international agreements entered into by the Commonwealth Executive 
and not otherwise covered by heads of Commonwealth legislative power? Is there some limitation derived from federal consideration, even when all elements of the federation are party to the agreements underpinning such legislation? Uh, those are questions yet to be fully answered. I explored some of them in the second Mason lecture here in 2017 and found little guidance more recent or useful than that of Cheryl Saunders' excellent paper um, in the Public Law Review in 2005. It can safely be said that the executive power could not be invoked to support an intergovernmental agreement under which the Commonwealth would legislate in um, uh, contravention of a constitutional guarantee or prohibition, or contrary to some principle such as separation of judicial from executive and legislative powers. That said, the, legis the executive power has an important role to play in developing national approaches to cross-jurisdictional matters of national significance. Michael Cromlin, along with Cheryl Saunders and Ben Rimmer, illuminated those issues in an ANZOG research paper for the Australian Public Service Review Panel in 2019. There are many issues which are not conveniently located under one or other of Commonwealth or state responsibilities. Some would require Commonwealth funding, intervention and state regulatory and service delivery agreement. Higher education is one, although on my quick reading of the Accord Panel interim report, uh, does not seem to have been engaged with forcibly. Uh, another is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice affairs. And perhaps one of the early tasks of the voice, if it is to be created, will be to address the future of cooperative federalism in engaging with some of the more intractable closing the, gate, closing the gap issues, many of which, of course, involve state issues, housing, education, health, policing, and so forth. Michael Cromwell has made a significant contribution to thinking about the executive power of the Commonwealth. He continues to do so, not least as a member of the Executive Power Project Committee uh, of the Centre for Public Integrity. One of the proposals of that committee uh, is reflected in a paper on the scrutiny of grants administration. There have been substantial deficiencies in that area. And if the Williams cases achieve anything, it should be a greater focus on lawfulness in Commonwealth executive funding programs and beyond that, their ethical administration. Michael Cromlin continues to contribute in this area. It's been an honour to present this lecture in recognition of his great service. Thank you, Justice French, for um, your, your lecture, which provided a, a masterful exegesis of the primary materials on executive power and scope uh, and limits and makes significant headway, I think, to providing some clarity to a field as you said, a quoting Michael Cromlin, traditionally shrouded in mystery. So I'd now uh, like to ask Professor A.G. Stone, Director of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies, uh, to offer a, a vote of thanks uh, and bring proceedings to a close. Thank you very much. It's uh, my pleasure uh, to bring these proceedings to a close with a vote of thanks to our lecturer, our inaugural Michael Cromlin lecturer. We've had a really lively and a fascinating account of a core principle of Australian constitutional law, which also connects with ideas of federalism and accountability, all three of which go to the heart of the scholarly life of Michael Cromlin, who we're here to honour. So I have to thank the quality Chief Justice for really the perfect inaugural lecture in this series and a truly wonderful start to a day of constitutional law that we will commence tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in thanking Honourable Robert French. Thank you.